Hi, welcome to this Open Security session in October 2023, and we're joined by Simon Worley and, and Marius on, you know, has to be one of my favorite topics, uh, especially, uh, I have to say, is the, the, the thing I've learned the most in the last five, 10 years, I've changed my perception. I have to add Gen AI to that now, I have to say, Simon, but, you know, uh, I still feel that it's one of those unexplored uh, areas that has so much that we we, we need to do to figure out how to really you know use it and it's not perfect but it's way better uh, than a lot of the things that we use so big big fan on on, on worldly maps so simon i know you, you got some uh things you want to present to us why don't we start there and then um and then we we start the q a out of it we we, we 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 can do perfectly happy to i i put some slides together because we were talking about uh weeks ago but before you you've already drop the gen AI, gen AI bomb <laughs> in here i mean I, i've got to say um the difference between chat gpt4 and the multimodal version uh of chat gtp uh the more visual version is is um night and day it's enormous uh, it uh, it's astronomical it um because part of the problem is um you know, it, this goes back to the concepts of an, um, uh, Nicholas Negroponte and uh, architecture by yourself. So the process of design is conversation yeah. going on between two designers or possibly uh, within the mind of one designer two two identities. And uh, but it's a conversation. But that conversation in text form was very much limited by rules and syntax and styles. And of course, th this goes all the way back to Yona Friedman's work on graphical conversation theory. Uh, getting into that graphical form, it's now much more about objects and relationships and, and, and context. It's a bit like when you're coding, how we often have whiteboards behind us yeah. to actually explain the problem on the whiteboard that we then code. Well, we've been trapped in that world of code, the world of storytelling and text and all the rest of it. Yeah. And, but this, this, new the new version of chachi uh, it it is totally uh, it's a complete this is what i've been waiting for i i wrote a post on this back in yeah. may last uh earlier this year which was following on one from uh previously uh, the fuss about conversational programming yeah. it's it, the medium is so important so it's enormous yeah. so if you haven't played with the multimodal form i can throw maps in there get yeah. it to interpret the map i can have a discussion with it build a better it's just incredible so i, I would argue that's Another typical point, but for me, the bit that it was already doing, which was the big game changer, was A, understanding context, so I can have a dialogue with it. But more importantly, is the ability to translate that into a context that I give it. So, for example, the biggest problem I had in the past was how do I tell that story in a way that makes sense to that individual, for that culture, for that experience, for, in a way, to even at the point of the journey that the individual is, that could never scale. Now we can now we can tell the story and make sure the story is coherent. I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with you here. Good <laughs> good on a panel. Um <laughs> is that beforehand uh we were talking about styles and rules and syntax and basically giving orders. So it was like uh, I need to improve this code, etc. And we were still trapped in that world of text. I think what we've got with the multimodal the multimodal forms are enable us to ask questions in a completely different way. And it, it is a huge trend. So everything everything before uh, uh, they released the multimodal version, I, I think will be forgotten to history. I mean, it was, yeah, yeah, it was so sort of exciting. This is where it's actually game on. This is where it really is a fundamental change. And it's the medium by which we can have the conversation. Um, yeah. But anyway, I've got some slides on weak signals. Uh, well, on mapping, because I have to talk about mapping. Of course, and, and, and uh, intelligence, right? So, and, so and, and, you... and connecting the dots, right? And uh, and uh, and and providing context, right? So, for example, like you know, just just maybe to so we can tie it a lot of this on you know mapping trade intelligence, right? And and that situation awareness. My challenge a lot in the past was how do I translate the situation awareness that we have here to the target audience, and and even with the map. Right, even when I got a map, I, I was I was able to create analysis. So I I was always being very frustrated because I could use maps, I could visualize in maps, I could think in maps. I always struggle to communicate those stories and to provide that. And now I can see how I can do that in a in a way that leads the the individual almost to 
they will be consuming the worldly maps. And then as they ask the questions, you can zoom in and go, oh, oh let me show you what actually happens behind the scenes. Where in the past, there was too much of a chasm there uh, on, on that part. Okay. And I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to agree. Uh, and <laughs> I'm going to explain why I agree as well. Um, but um, we'll get there. I'm going to share some slides. I've also got a current research project. Uh, well, I've got one going on in video gaming coming up. I did sustainability. I did cybersecurity. I think I'll spend a few minutes taking yes, through that. Yes, that was my ask well. before, because you've done a, a lot of great work, and I joined a couple. But I know, I know if you finish it off, it would be great to see the outcome of that <laughs> research project. Oh, it's not written up yet. Uh, I mean, I have um, the time between when the research project finishes me right up is quite some time because I've got such a backlog. Show, show the but I will show you. Output. I will show you. All right. Let, yeah. let, let's get started anyway. Too much chatting for me. Um, <laughs> how can you see that? OK. Yes, we can. Yeah. Right. So let me go uh, view uh, da -da, full screen mode. OK, so um, very, very quickly, I'm going to talk about uh, origin, how I got into maps, and that's going to be super, super quick. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about patterns, and then I'm going to talk about the problems with weak signals. Okay. So for me, this all started uh, running a company, didn't know what I was doing, completely clueless, ended up um, uh, reading um, uh, uh, Sun Tzu's The Art of War. So Sun Tzu taught about five factors, matter and competition. Have a purpose, a moral imperative, understand your landscape, the environment you're competing in, understand the climactic patterns, so how the landscape is changing, understand doctrines, so the principles of organization, then you're into gameplay. And this overlaps very nicely with John Boyd's OODA loop. You've got the game, you observe the environment, that's what landscape and climactic patterns are about, then you orientate yourself around the space, and then you're into sort of uh, um, action, uh, what well, decision and action this is where you're into the whole sort of uh, uh, leadership part and this got me really into landscape uh, you know what do we mean by landscape so that got me into maps so I read loads on military history and all the rest of it things like this um, and I, I got really excited by maps and so I asked uh, my company uh, everybody who was working for me give me your maps and they gave me loads of maps customer journey maps my maps systems maps loads of them business process maps and I took one systems map here it is a number of components connected by connections took one component CRM moved it and asked how has the map changed and the answer is it hasn't uh, which is unusual because if I take a geographic map and I take a map of the world and move, I don't know, Australia, put it next to the UK, obviously that has changed. It hasn't changed here because it's not a map, it's a graph. And so the thing that every single map I had had in common was none of them were actually maps. They were all graphs. And just to explain the difference there very quickly, uh, the three images at the top, they're all graphs. Uh, three places, Nottingham, London, Dover, connected by two roads, M1, M2, roughly. Uh, they're all identical. And the three images underneath it are all maps, and they are completely different. And the reason why they are completely different is uh, because of the compass, because that gives a property, uh, and that property is it gives space meaning. So the difference between a graph and a map is in a map, the space has meaning. So you can't just simply move a component and uh, it remains the same just because the connections are the same. So that's the distinction between a graph and a map. Uh, and space only has meaning, well, obviously, when you're mapping against uh, some form of landscape. Now, in order to do this, uh, you need three basic components, anchor, such as magnetic north, position of pieces, this is north, south, east, and west of that, and consistency of movement. So if I go north, I go north, if I go south, I go south. And so that's where I started. Uh, and the, the example I always do is a tea shop. If you're mapping a tea shop, you start, what's the anchor? The public consuming tea, the business who wants to sell cups of tea, right? Well, that's anchors, that's not enough. Cup of tea has needs. It needs tea cup, needs hot water, kettle, power. So you've got a chain of needs that describes position through a concept of visibility. And then, of course, all of these components are evolving. And so that gives you movement and evolution. And so this is what you end up with is a map. And in this map, if you move a piece, it fundamentally changes the meaning of a map of the map because it's a map. There we are. That's super simple. All right, pants. Turns out when you start mapping out spaces, you learn lots of patterns. 
uh, there are climactic patterns, there's uh, uh, doctrine, which is about organizational patterns, there's leadership patterns. There's about 30 climactic patterns, 40 doctrine, about 100 different forms of gameplay. All right. So I'm going to talk about climactic patterns and then bring in weak signals into this. So uh, the climactic patterns, here's the horrible list that I'm going to talk about, is everything evolves through supply and demand competition. Components can co-evolve. Higher order systems create new sources of value. Efficiency enables innovation. Success breeds inertia. Very, very, very simple patterns that come out of mapping, which you can apply to a map. So an example. Uh, this is compute roughly in 2004, using these an application, best coding practice on a runtime, on an operating system, or best architectural practice on compute. That was 2004. The first pattern you learn is everything evolves, so we knew that it would eventually become a utility, sure enough, uh, AWS EC2 2006. The next pattern you learn is past success breeds inertia. So all of those with big data centers and lots of practices in that space had inertia to the change, perfectly normal. The next pattern you learn is that as underlying components evolve, you get a change of practice. So we go from high mean time to recovery to low mean time to recovery. So we go from scale up to scale out. We go from disaster recovery to, to, to um, uh, chaos engines. Uh, so we're distributing systems now, we're using chaos engines, you know, we're no longer um, uh, doing things like capacity planning, we don't need to do that anymore, we're not having to do M plus one anymore, all those sorts of things. Okay. Uh, the next pattern you learn, oh, and those new patterns. New, new practices we gave a word we called devops eventually efficiency enables innovation standard pattern commoditization so as things become a commodity you get the appearance of new things like i don't know, netflix higher order systems create new sources of value or worth basic standard patterns useful for investment so when i look at a map I can basically see what's changing. I can go where we should invest and also where we should not invest. So existing practices and servers in the data center. And it's simply by using this map, um, or a more complicated version. This is how at Ubuntu, we attacked the market. We were like 3% the operating system um, against Red Hat Microsoft. They had all the money, all the people and everything else. It took us 18 months. We took 70% of all cloud. Not because we're genius. We just knew where to attack. Really simple. All right. So when it comes to weak signals, um, there are a whole bunch of things you're looking for uh, when it comes to this particular set of patterns or this sort of change. Uh, evolutionary change, past success breeding inertia. Lots of people complain, uh, dismissing the future uh, system, high levels of efficiency of the future system. A new set of changing practices should be emerging, which are associated with speed. You should see rapid innovation with people built on top and uh, those new systems creating value. And those are things that you can look for uh, if you're looking for a change in the market pace caused by climactic patterns. And a classic example of this we saw in 2014. So by 2010, the emerging practice got uh, new name DevOps. By 2014, the runtime further up the stack started to become more of a utility and it had exactly those patterns which is why in 2014 you should know should have known aws lambda was going to become huge this is where we need to go much more into the serverless space which is why your strategy should have changed because everything underneath it eventually is now heading towards the new legacy um you know your strategy in 2016 is completely different from what it was in 2008. Your focus should have been on serverless, the emerging practices, et cetera, and that's what we're seeing grow today. All perfectly standard. I just wanna reiterate that. Um, your strategy in 2016 is totally different from what it is in 20, uh, 2008. And the guide to it should have been those signals. You should have seen the efficiency. You should have seen people building things rapidly on top. Lots of inertia, lots of people resisting this change. Uh, those practices associated with speed, rapid development of new things with new sources of value, etc. They're all the sort of signals that you look for. So uh, you can read more about that in a wonderful book called The Flywheel Effect by Dave Anderson. And then you get to another set of patterns, leadership. So let's have a look at those. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them, which we're not gonna go through, except for one sensing engines, a particular model called ILC. 
It's a very, very simple model. Uh, you take something, you turn it into a commodity, you expose it as an API so other people can build on top. You mine the metadata because they're building on top of your API. So you can mine the, the uh, uh, your, you, know, you have to build them. So you mine the mill billing data to see what is becoming popular. So you identify new components in that, industrialized new component services. The people you've just chewed up scream, oh, they've eaten our business model. Everybody else cheers because they can more rapidly build new things on top of that. It's a very simple model. You get everybody else to innovate for you. You mine metadata to spot future patterns. You commoditize to component services. And the reason why you use this model is written back in, I wrote it back in 2005, is now your rate of innovation, customer focus, efficiency, all increase with the size of the ecosystem people building on top. And um, so you use it to climb up the stack on the right-hand side. So you compute machine learning engines, platforms, whatever it happens to be, you're, you're building up on the right hand side of the stack. Now you'll read about this in a book called Reaching Cloud Velocity, uh, AWS's second ever book. It's got about 17 pages of mapping in there. It's got the IRC model in there, basically. Um, it describes how they chew up industry after industry. And it's very simple to spot. You look for certain patterns, so known for providing components, focused on enabling others to build, harvesting of ecosystem, obsess ob obsession with efficiency, obsession with customer focus, considered highly innovative, despite the fact they're not doing any of it, rapid growth up the stack. So if you spot the, those particular signals, you know somebody's playing that game against you. Now, that's uh, one bunch of climactic patterns and a bunch of signals associated with that. That's one specific leadership pattern. There's a bunch of signals associated with that. Of course, there's a massive amount to this field. But you can reapply this in other areas. So if I look at something, uh, this is the automotive industry. Um, this was done in 2015 at the DVLA, looking at how it was changing. So this was uh, uh, where it was going in 2025, many, many things becoming much more commodity-like, increasing use of intelligent agents, etc. cetera. Uh, you simply overlap China's gameplay. We see them doing exactly the same sort of game, you know, heavier uh, focus in terms of climbing up the stack, efficiency on one side, uh, they're encouraging uh, um, uh, joint ventures and, of course, accused of harvesting the ecosystem. It's all the same, same thing. It's, a, it's basically a classic ILC model. And if you know that, um, you know that the bigger their ecosystem gets, the same with Amazon, the more innovative, efficient, customer focused they are, the more impossible they are to play. There are ways of countering that, but at least you know the game they're playing. Right, so now here's the problem. That's all wonderful stuff. And there's a wonderful book come, come out called uh, Leading by Weak Signals, uh, which has loads of maps in there. Uh, it's by Peter Gomez and Mark Lambert. Um, so I've been having a look through that. And it's got lots of forms of maps in there. Uh, but the problem with the book is it's probably only got an audience of about a thousand people. Uh, the reason people is most people don't understand their landscape. Uh, we compete in multiple landscapes, you know, not just territorial, but obviously uh, technological, economic, social and political landscapes. And if we just have a look at the economic and technological landscapes, we have very poor understanding of the environment. We've seen this from all the problems we've had with supply chains in the economic space. So our first problem is we've got very, very poor awareness of the landscapes we are competing in. Uh, that's assuming uh, that we can, um, we realize that we are actually competing in landscapes. But there's a second problem. And for that, I'm gonna share something else. Can you see a mirror board? Uh, yes, I can. And that's right. leading, leading by, by weak signals by Peter Gomez, right? Yes, it is. And Mark Lambert's. So uh, what I did is I took about 60 odd people who are all. So I, I run these groups where we where we look at an industry like defense, like healthcare, like uh, finance, education. And we try and map out the space and understand what's important, where to invest. And so we did one on cybersecurity. So I took about about 60, 70 people, all from different parts of cybersecurity. And the first thing we do is ask them what matters. And so they came up with a load of things that matters, uh, phishing attacks, security, targeted attacks, detection, this, trust, loads of all of this stuff matters. All right, that's great. How do we work out what of all of this stuff actually matters? 
Well, the first thing I ask them to do is group it into themes or what we call perspectives. And so they, they, they group this into things like risk management, security awareness, procurement, infrastructure, threat, identity, data, people, uh, a bunch of different themes. And then what we do is we ask them, self-organize into group, map out uh, you know, the most of those themes. In fact, they choose a number of them. Uh, I think it was about six. And they chose to map out people, technology advancements, risk management, security awareness, data and threat. Now, this is all done over a period of 10 hours. And so what they do is they go and map out each of these areas. Now, why would you do that? You do that because I want you to imagine um, uh, you want to find out what, what are the most important landmarks in, say, Paris, but no one's ever been to Paris. So you send one group out there to map Paris and they come back with a map. They've obviously mapped it from a perspective. Um, how do you know the map's right? It's wrong. They might have mapped it from the perspective of the nicest places to buy pizza. And so they, they will say the number one place is Pierre's Pizza Parlor. OK, fine. Um, so what you do is you send multiple groups out to map it from different perspectives. And then you can ask the question, what are the most important land map, landmarks across multiple maps? And then you can aggregate that together. Um, so this is what they did. They they went through as a group. They map out their particular Simon's spaces. Doing a really good, like, overall, and now he's going through the... Oops. Sorry. That's all right. Does all right. that make sense, by the way? Yeah, yeah, no, it's really good. No, exactly. I was just seeing your praises here. But uh, keep going. No, I, 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 I click the mute. Oh, hey, no problem at all. So, so they map out things like cybersecurity from the perspective of people. So, so they, they've added a whole bunch of components in here, and they're looking at things like risk management, total stakeholders, assets, situational awareness, protection, etc. And then they do it from you know they, uh, all of these. So they're broken into different groups. We do this. Um, and then we we run this all in parallel so you've got one group down here who was mapping it from the point of view of awareness and one group who are mapping over here from the point of view of risk management now you can see they circle around this area uh, because that's when we ask the question once they've got a map and they've got embedded in their perspective of the landscape we ask them the question what matters okay where should we invest and uh get them to highlight the most important areas so from the perspective of cyber security risk management they highlighted things like better risk analysis skills llm data now that's not going on to... that one sorry can you just zoom in because I, yeah. I think that one for me has one of the best examples of why llm is gonna completely you know make a massive change in our industry let's zoom out a little bit sorry so you can see so yeah. So what, what, what we've done here, if you look at it, is that you basically have multiple elements of the cybersecurity industry, right? From a risk point of view, right? And then the interesting argument was, you see that LLMs in the bottom right, um, kind of the, the alone, the LLM that it's alone on the bottom right. Um, you, I think, yeah. You, yeah, your mouse. So so the, the, the argument that we were talking about was that before ChatGPT, that was all the way to the left, mm -hmm. right? So this is, for me, it's a great example. I've used it several times to explain why sometimes things change overnight or change very quickly. Mm -hmm. It's because that LLMs before ChatGPT, and, and you probably can argue even if, maybe even now with, with the visual element, the multi-model was kind of to the left. Now that it's there, it mm -hmm. means that all those secure LLMs, which are pretty primitive, are gonna go very fast. Mm -hmm. So this, in the past, it, I almost sometimes view this as gravity, right? In the past, the security LLMs struggle to move to the right because they were anchored by the LLMs foundation that was mm -hmm. in a way on Genesis. Now that the LLMs are getting the, to, close to commodity or, or very productized, they're going to pull, right? The gravity is going to pull all the security LLMs. Yep. And if you want those guys at the top, in a way, you either embrace that and then, you know, and your strategy should be changing because you know the security LLMs are going to, going to move all the way to the right so, very, so very quickly. So one way to test whether that is true is going yeah. all the way back to the weak signals in here. And here we are. Here we have our pattern, things industrialized. Yeah. So 
you know, are you seeing lots of signs of inertia because of past success in previous ways of doing it? Are you yeah. seeing this as an evolutionary change associated with efficiency? So is it, are, <laughs> is, is, is that going on? Are you seeing a change of practice associated yeah. with speed? Maybe it's got new terms like prompt engineering or whatever. Yeah. Are you seeing rapid innovation built on top with new sources of value being created? Because if you are, then you know this is the stage that you're actually at. Yeah, well, I, I guess the answer to every one of those is check, 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 right? <laughs> and, and, and I think the thing that I found most fascinating is, yeah. is the inertia. I have to yeah. say that I know I see so many people, even companies or even individuals that I, I could totally see the inertia because mm -hmm. I can see that they look for the flaws and going, oh, that's not why it's relevant. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it's, I, I, I had the analogy I was talking to somebody saying, it's like Jarvis, right? You know, Iron Man Jarvis. Mm -hmm. is that we have Jarvis and people now say it's not good enough because when we ask Jarvis to sing, he didn't do a good job. Or we mm. ask him to, you know, to do... Oh, it hallucinates. Poem, it hallucinates. Jarvis hallucinates. Yeah, but... but what do we what think innovation do... is other than a hallucination? <laughs> exactly, I mean, hallucination right? is not a bug. It's a feature. It's a feature. But anyway, exactly. <laughs> so, so, so now, anyway, that's... Um, we do this across all of these different maps. And then what you do is you've now got multiple perspectives so we've got in total here we are nice little summary diagram we've got six different perspectives data organization uh, cybersecurity in the perspective of awareness from risk management and on each of these maps now the group have highlighted what's important so with people regenerative culture regenerative supply chain these are the words that they use uh, risk management skills better risk analysis um, uh, security awareness, etc. They've highlighted the most important areas. And then what we do is we aggregate across the lot. Okay, so you it's a simple task and bring it all together, aggregation, and then by by finding the 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 themes which are most common, you create a priority list. And it turns out that your priority list in cybersecurity is about building a a, a resilient culture. The, the top four things. Uh, seem to be about building a resilient culture, rapid growth of AI, cyber immunity, i.e. organizations constantly attacking themselves and getting used to being attacked in order to harden themselves up and learning. So you end up with these sort of core themes, which the then what we do is we, we go and do a, a, an examination um, of uh, what's going on in the uh, wider space. Uh, this is by comparing analysts against what the actual group comes up with and what we discover is that the analysts are mostly focused on process automation, continuous monitoring, digital sovereignty, nation state. Now, God knows why they get excited by that sort of stuff. Uh, whereas uh, the group itself was uh, more about resilient culture, cyber immunity, rapid growth of our AI, and actually awareness of the supply chain management. You've got to learn about that sort of stuff. So this is where SPOMs and all the rest of it come into play. Can and you, so why could you just explain me better more how to read this? So what, what does the colors oh and, so and, so and thing mean? so um it will be when I write it up. So the, the yellow dots is I aggregate a whole bunch of analyst reports and run them through the same process. So I can see what they think is high priority, what they think is low priority. Uh the pur purple dots are where the group was. Okay. Uh, and then what I do is also I take the entire list and I send it through chat GPT and BARD because they're trained on large sets of data so they give me a sort of background signal of what the general market feels uh so i asked chat gpt and bard to order them as well and so so that's the red and the blue uh so the the really the ones you concentrate really on are the yellow uh, and the purple and you can see there's quite a big distinction uh so um the only area uh, that the group agreed with the analyst on was the rapid growth of AI. That was the only space. Otherwise, mm. there's quite a big distinction between, you know, what they thought was important. Um, now, the reason why I mentioned this is because you think about resilient culture, cyber immunity. Um, so it's about making your organization capable of coping with shocks and being constantly under attack. So improving its hardness mm -hmm. to, to those sorts of shocks. I mean, those are obvious sort of things. But that's not what was being mentioned in the analyst report. And I think it was the next day, I think, Denise, it was either yourself or uh, with another group, this whole conversation, uh, this ridiculous idea 
and there was a CISO quite proudly showing off a board of shame that they were using in their organization. So they, they would do phishing attacks and everybody failed, went on the board of shame, which is almost <laughs> the reverse. This is not how you build a resilient culture or build up cyber immunity. This is actually how you dismantle any form of culture that you have within that organization. You create a system of fear and it's it's almost the reverse of what you want to do. So there this leads me to the second problem because the first problem is that we don't understand our landscapes anyway so the weak signal stuff is really exciting i'd love it but for most people it's fairly irrelevant because we don't actually understand our landscapes and and, and the second problem we have is the utter idiocy uh that we do in places um we, even basic things like uh how we build resilient cultures which obviously should be a focus um, I'm afraid in some places we're not even doing that. And at that point, I'll go quiet. So how do you measure that? Because one of the, I have to say, one of the frustrations that I feel we still have, and, and, and this is a good one to, to bring Mario's on this, is that I still feel that a lot of security, it's still a marketing exercise. And I, I'll give you an example. Imagine three organizations. One has that CISO. One has, you know, maybe the other extreme, you know, super, you know, more enlightened. And I completely agree that that's what not to do, by the way. You know, one has great practices responding quite well. And then one in the middle. At the moment, we don't have a good way to let the market promote and reward the good player. Yeah, I think I think you know you're very right. I think you know it's it all stems from what you know what Simon mentioned about the culture. You know, there's um, we still carrying. I think loads of organizations are still carrying that legacy view of you know security saying no, security you know being stick instead of a carrot. So you know, I'm always the the kind of person that always thinks about how we can you know communicate and collaborate with people to actually help them understand how the security work and and you know like phishing simulations we trying to you know it's never a blame culture it's always about how you encourage people to report bad behavior because you build a two-way collaboration you always you know encourage instead of you know noticing someone who failed you noticing people who you know uh might detect the emails and praising people for their good work. That's how you breed, you know, the, I think the culture sort of spin. We never say no. And that's that's one other thing, you know, we actually talked within my team last week. When did the last time we said no to someone in security? And we couldn't remember. We didn't say, we didn't, we never say no. We always say yes. But let's look at from security perspective, what do we need to be able to say, yo, yes, for example, what are requirements of security to be able to say yes? And that's how we always, you know, we're always playing around availability and security. Because I think sometimes people forget, you know, there's a lot of organizations that add security for the sake of security. I Can I just say, I love that. I absolutely love that. Thank you. I mean, so back in the oh, 1990s, I used to uh, run security for an organization called Harrods, which obviously as the uh, as in the IT security. And, and one of the things I would do is attack the organization. Of course, when we found weaknesses rather than go around and because unfortunately there was a big culture of fear in that organization rather yeah. than go around beat people up and say we'd involve them in the group to do the next round of attacks because you'd learn from the process you know so it wasn't a case of you know uh um, you know you go and hit somebody with a stick oh, uh, put them on a wall oh, god i can't believe in, in in 2023 somebody puts up a wall of shame i mean that's just anyway Oh, um, but um, so I, I love hearing the words that you were saying. Yeah, it's always either involvement or another thing that really, really helps, I think, for us is make it personable. Whenever we have examples of, say, phishing, you know, we're always trying to relate, you know, examples of various banking scams, SMS scams that we find in the wild and how it relates to people's, you know, external families, external sort of known people circle and how we can relate that, you know, how you, you're enhancing your security knowledge, not only for the job you do, but your personal life, how you protect your personal bank details, 
you know, your personal money and personal details as in, you know, what can be used for nefarious purposes. So I think when you relate, when you connect those two dots, it always sort of a big light bulb goes up in, in sort of people's head. But we, we need a way to share this information. And I think a really good sign is the sign that the insurance industry is really raising the bar because they got burned quite spectacularly by distributing insurance as confetti for a while and then and then got burned, right? Because they were not evaluating correctly the security posture. And now they're starting to put pressure. And you know, if, even if you look at that simple example, which I would argue, you know, it's almost like if they, if they don't have the awareness to understand why that's a problem, you know, it's, we can bet that there's going to be another 40 things they're going to be doing wrong. <laughs> it's like, it's almost like the canary on the coal mine. But how we need a way to expose that. We need a way for the market to become more efficient. In fact, we need a way for the senior management to understand that's what's happening and the need, right? And maybe the senior management loves it. Great. And maybe it's a cultural problem within the organization. Okay, right? You, there's a moment where you draw the line, you know, a bad company is going to be a bad company, right? Um, but it might not be that their customers are that happy with. It's kind of like pollution, right? So in, in a weird way, we now have very little acceptance for companies that claim all sorts of things and behind the scenes they're polluting like mad and they're destroying environments and they have really bad ethical practices. I think we need a way. And I, I think MAPS is part of the solution. I think MAPS is one of the ways this can work quite effectively uh, and also translating it to particular audiences. So you reward the teams that are doing a good job, the teams that build a good culture. You know, if anything, Marius is giving us better arguments when we justify why we do certain things, right? Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the, I'm a big proponent as well. You know, sometimes people forget that security is part of the, you know, business. We need to align security to business. How it comes, you know, when yeah. some of the security professionals, when you talk, you know, when you ask for a security professional, how does your security program you know, help your business bottom line. They always get mind boggled. Oh, you know, bottom line is not our concern. But that's that's the thing, you know, how do we build accountability? How do we make people understand what security is all about? That's one thing that is always, you know, I, I guess it's not portrayed very well because sometimes people, you know, hide behind accountability. Uh, and... Um, and that's what needs to change, I guess, it, as our industry matures. But then we are the problem, right? The security professional is the problem. Some of them, yes. Some of them are, yeah, yeah. And I think I think there's maps. You know, I, I what I like about, and I'm going to keep throwing the other lens into this, right? I think we can scale that now in ways that before was just not possible. I think it's now possible to take a map, a visualization, a practices that a temp company is doing and provide narratives that are anchored, you know, in a way I bias, you know, through a particular way that we can then get some good data on the back of it and going, that's okay, that's not okay. Like I'm telling you, like I have that problem. Like I have freaking suppliers coming out of, you know, <laughs> like every better organization and it's gonna go even more because we're gonna get a marketplace, right? So I really wanna make sure that I can push security down and understand the metrics in in my, for example, third party supply environment. So yeah. how can we scale that, Simon? How can I get? I I I will put a policy that says I want every team to give me a worldly map of of security of of how you operate. Well, well, it's not just an organization in terms of a company problem. This is a massive problem from a nation state point oh, of yeah, view. Yeah. Yeah, but let's uh, let's solve it organization problem. Well, right? like, I know, but <laughs> but. but a classic example of this, uh, one of the best I've seen, it's not a map, it's a graph, it is the work which was done by the Complexity Group in Vienna for Hungary. So what they did is they took VAT transaction records. So, you know, when, when, whenever you transact with someone else, there's value added tax and Hungary collects them at a, a transaction level. So they were able to graph out yeah. uh, the entire economy. Uh, which is amazing. And what they found is there were 90,000 old companies. And I think it was about 100 companies represented about 70% of the systemic risk of the entire economy. Yeah. And it was something like about 30 companies were about 25% or something. So any one of those 30 having a problem, you yeah. lose 25% of your GDP, but which is like have a that. terrifying yeah, yeah. thought. <laughs> but I would argue that sudden, most companies are like that. 
In fact, I would argue that most internal systems are like that. The challenge is, in fact, I had this exact conversation with my team a couple of weeks ago where we had a big incident. And, I, and, I, I, and we're now mapping, for example, which parts of the organization that we're going to leave to burn, which parts, well, in a nice way, but which parts we're going to run straight away because those are the 20% that keep the st stores open, right? They are mm -hmm. the 20% that if they are alive, we can deal with the rest okay. But if they have a freaking heart attack, then we, you know we have a problem. Yeah. So, think, so if you, oh sorry, no, go ahead, go ahead, Sam. Well, I was going to say if you think about the Hungary example, yeah, other nations can't do that. The UK, we don't collect uh, transaction level VAT records. France won't do so until twenty thirty. Yeah. So they're operating in spaces where they do not understand that landscape. Yeah. So we cannot see the pattern. So, you know, we get hit by shops all the time. And yeah. yes, absolutely, it's true with organization. This is why things like SPOM, yeah. Software Bill of Materials, okay, it only gets you to the point of graphing. And there's a world of difference between when something's a commodity and when it's yeah. custom bill. So ideally, we want to get to match. But we're lacking the basic information. This is why, when, you know, the title of this was about weak signals. Weak yeah. signals, it's like iRobot, we're like hacker bloke, blah, blah, blah. That's great, but it's fantasy for most people. And yeah. it's fantasy because they don't even have the basic understanding of the landscape. And even more terrifying, they're not even doing the basic simple things of yeah. building resilient cultures within what they've got already yeah. so you know there's an awful lot of groundwork and that, which is almost why weak signals is i love the topic i love books like this i think this book is great and there's some really good stuff and i can see but it's, it's a bit like how the analyst always want to talk about nation state security what's the <laughs> point if you if you don't actually understand the landscape yeah that, that's the thing i don't know why but for some reason nowadays we keep talking about tools about innovation and about this new shiny blinker 3000 that's going to solve all our problems but people keep forgetting yeah why why would you start talking about nation states if a script kitty can breach your you know defenses because maybe you don't have 10 visibility in your assets maybe you don't even start doing the basics like you don't have your data flow mapped and you don't know where the data is going and where it's stored how your, some of your assets are managed from hardening perspective, you know. That's why I think in a way, it sort of underlines the problem because what we spoke within when I was in San or Network event, 2010s was all about reducing the likelihood of risk. And I believe that 2020s are shaping now in saying, we can't reduce likelihood anymore because it's inevitable that something's going to happen. So let's work on resilience, how we can maintain business operations and reduce the impact of their cyber attack and, and that's not focus about the likelihood anymore. Look, I argue that my job as a CISO is to allow the business to take risk. Yeah. That's my job. My job is to make sure the business takes the right amount of risk for with the right amount of understanding, with the right amount of mitigations, and in a way that incidents don't become crisis. Yeah. Because because cool. the business needs to operate at a level of risk. It happens all the time. We have stores open, right? Like yeah. You know, yeah, you can walk to a store, right? Like you don't have, we don't have military guys at at the, at you know at our stores when you go and buy your vitamins. By the way, we have great new products from the Yeah, because that's the thing. Like if you look at the latest, <laughs> very healthy. But I, I, I do with the machine gun and a lot of security guards at the entrance is not going to really work yeah. very well. Although you might problem, make it more secure. <laughs> if you look at the latest uh, Greg's Wondergaard's book, he's he's poised a very important question every year. The cybersecurity budgets are getting bigger, but we're not getting less breaches. We're getting more breaches every year while we're spending more on cybersecurity. So there is a fundamental... Yeah, but breakage. we also have a lot more interconnectivity. Right? Like, come on, if you look at the side effects of a cyber breach in 2023 versus 2020 or 2010, right? You know, it's kind of like, it's very different, right? And there's a lot, I think... Well, hang on. Yes... But remember, we also have very little understanding of the landscape itself. Yeah. Most organized, very poor understanding of the space. And I think Marius is hitting on a really, really important point because um, from what came from that cybersecurity group was the critical things of the four things was awareness of your landscape, supply chain, uh, so software bill of material, supply chain management uh, was in that group of four and rapid growth of AI. So that's a technology thing. But the real two big ones were resilient culture and cyber immunity. And they're about people. 
not about technology. So that's about how you build a culture which copes with shocks and manages those shocks and how you toughen up that culture so that people yeah. become sensitive. And it, this is why that whole sort of wall of shame thing is such a oh. daft, or creating cultures of fear are so yeah. incredibly daft things to do. Yeah. So unfortunately, you know, when I look at sort of the analyst reports, it's a continuous monitoring, uh, it's more analytics, more big data process automation, big one, big one. That's all about technology. So I, I think there's some fundamentals here in terms of, you, you know, we've got to focus on the people and building a resilient culture and building that concept of cyber immunity within our organization. I think then on, on top of that, we've got to improve our awareness. Then we can start talking about these wonderful new things. I think the real danger is people say, oh, well, AI will magically solve this. I've got to say, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with Marius on here, yeah. the sort of the magical sort of like, hey, this piece of technology will magically do it. I, we've got to get back to fundamentals and i think yeah. on the back of that simon i think the great point is the big talent shortage is another bull because we all know to me I, I personally as well you know yes some of the you need some of the skills in specific niches but when you're hiring security teams most of the two of the most important skills for myself is aptitude and attitude you can teach the rest of them but if someone has a right attitude and aptitude to learn, it will be very easy to get them and learn the tech. Sometimes we, you know, job descriptions and people hiring teams saying, oh, we don't have specific talent shortage. I love that. And I, the reason why I love that, and thank you so much for saying that, is, is because it's often, you know, the, we've got a, a talent problem, a skill. It's always the people are the problem. No, the people are the solution. They're, they're your yeah. positive things. That that's the they're not the problem. They are where the answer actually is. We've got we've got to change this sort of attitude. So, so I've, I've been have. trying to do this quite a bit, right? And actually, actually, Sam, I would like your views on this. So I'm a big fan of first of all, I completely agree. We don't have a skills shortage. I think we have a skills transfer problem. Right. What we need to get into cybersecurity is a lot more people from other fields because what they have is an aptitude and a, and, a, and a motivation and an understanding and a maturity that we don't have right now. Right. And and so he he's he's kind of the way I think about this is I can hire somebody, let's say bands one to five, right? Five is top, one is lower. I can hire a cybersecurity analyst at band three, which is actually quite expensive if you think about it, right? You know, and I would argue today, there's a premium that we're paying because of the skill shortage. What I want to do is I want to hire a specialist at band for from another industry, a doctor, an engineer, a poet, you know, a restaurant manager, right? An individual that really has a lot of great knowledge. And I want to bring them to cybersecurity because they have that experience. The problem in the past, and I've done a couple of cases, they've been successful. My challenge was how to infuse that person with cybersecurity knowledge once they're ready and once they want to drink it. And I have to say, I know that not a tool is not such for everything, but the Gen AI ability that we will have, not yet, to create customized learning paths, to create agents, bots, training environments that allow an individual to learn at a much faster pace, I feel that can be a piece of the puzzle that allow us to bring a lot more people into our industry in a much more effective way. You you do, but if I um, obviously I mapped out the education system with a whole bunch of professors of education, we thought the education system was all about maximizing opportunity and critical thinking, and it's not. It's about producing social cohesion and useful economic units. So yeah, those I'm same not talking bots, about them. So I'm I'm going to start no, at the more those evolved same crowd. bots and tools can have the do be used in a way that this that does what you say, but it can also be used to create new balls of shame. Uh, so, so I would be careful. <laughs> You've got to yeah. think about those. So we've got some questions. One yeah, of them was... Jim, uh, do you want to jump in? Because I think you, you can ask your question now. So, Yeah, cheers. Um, so, Simon, I came to your session at um, um, the um, um, Centre Parks years ago and asked you about risk. And you pointed me this book, which you can't see, which is, uh, well, I don't know, it's called The Search for Value. Um, and it relates, um, I asked you a question about risk and um, you pointed to that book which um, has got lots of equations in it. But I think the most useful thing it does is it shows that risk is in some ways a reciprocal of, of business value, of stock value. It's like, it's a direct relation. Yeah. Um, so I know that you're a risk guy. Um, what, 
And, and, and thanks for, so much for sharing the research. I, I saw that risk analysis was an area of focus. So I just, yeah. just wanted to talk on that. Well, so the risk analysis uh, in terms of this group, it was what are the major areas? And, and so the ones that were right at the very top were very much about people type stuff. Uh, so very much culture and cyber immunity. And uh, lower down, there was the concept of risk analysis. Now, from my point of view, um, when we start talking about risk analysis, I'm talking about value, I'm talking about things like capital flow, I'm using maps, because I'm actually using the interconnections between the different components, because every line in a map is a bi-directional exchange of value, or, you know, I give money for a cup of tea or whatever. Uh, and, you know, risk itself is just another form of asset that flows in these sorts of maps. But in order to assess that, I've got to actually understand the landscape. And so I've got a fundamental problem is that I generally don't understand the landscape. So, uh, other, you know, without this sort of stuff, it's the same with the economic system. It's mostly sticking fingers in the air and having a good guess. Uh, it's exactly the same with sustainability, you know, scope three. It's all estimation because we, again, we don't understand the components and the connections between them. So, um, I, I do like the risk management stuff, uh, the risk analysis. I, I'm going to say, from my point of view, we've still got huge weaknesses in actually understanding the environments that we're actually operating. And until we do start to understand those, it, it, it's it, it, we're still going to be in the world of guessing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. I, I mean, I suppose I suppose I was, I was hoping that you'd, you'd talk about some technical framework or decision making framework or ways of, of, of gathering information. What do you think about the large language models? Do you think they can help with with risk analysis? So I, I, I think you know, as I said at the beginning, I think there's a huge change between chat GPT-4 and the multimodal form of uh, chat GPT, because now we can actually start having a conversation uh, with them. And, and it's huge. It's as nice and day. It's, it's that sort of scale. Um, and so I think there are, you know, I'm already using them to help create maps and so forth of the space and starting to have conversations. Uh, I think we're still very early days. I think there's some real potential there once we get a handle on the landscapes, because we compete across multiple landscapes, territorial, technological, economic, political and, and, and cultural landscapes. Only one of them the territorial, do we have a handle on? Do we have maps and radars and all the rest of it and that sort of stuff? The other four, it's it's often, you know, people talk about digital sovereignty. Well, where are your borders? Where are you going to compete or conflict with others, I should say? Where are you going to cooperate, collaborate? You can't answer those questions without actually answer, understanding the landscape. We can do that in territorial. So we're lacking those basic things. So your question, can it help? I think we're getting there. Uh, we're starting to be actually able to have conversations outside of the world of text. And so I think that's a massive improvement. Sure. Does that answer your question, Jim? Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks for sharing the research. Really interesting. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure. Absolute delight. So, so Jim, the way, the way I connect that, and I feel, again, I think we have a golden opportunity now to really make sense, is to connect risk right with other parts to have that situation awareness where in the past risk at top level was a bunch of spreadsheets then you have a gap then you had reality then you might have maps i think we now can start to be able to graph them out connect them create narratives and then use the maps to drive behaviors right and to drive situation awareness but it's the connectivity that is super important like for example do do people understand the risks of what the decisions they're making? A project, do, doing a project, does it increase, does it decrease, does it maintain your risk? I think that was the thing that was always missing. When the exec make a decision, do they understand the ramifications of the decisions they're making, right? And I think that in the past was impossible. It was their gaps, right? It was spreadsheets or even system A and system B, you know, like Simon got this great picture of a company has 25 risk analysts, systems, right? Or 100 systems or 1,000 systems. But I think we we now have an opportunity to connect them. There's a, there's a, a bunch of technologies and processes and, and, and thinking that are, are converging. And, um, but I feel the LLMs provide the connection dot between them that allows us to do translations in the past, in a way that in the past was impossible or requires so much engineering cost that nobody could do it. So watch this space, I think is really cool. So final final thoughts on last couple of minutes. Uh, you got another question oh, from sorry, Tristan. Question from Tristan. Yes, you're right. Um, I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself. You should be able to, but um, we I can ask is what what's the threat intelligence equivalent 
threat intelligence equivalent of the Hungarian VAT records graph. So where, you know, that graph that we can do on threat intelligence that gives us that visibility and find those 50 or 20, you know, mission critical spots. I, I, I think, you know, you're starting to see, you know, the requirement for the US government, the executive order, the SPOMs. Yeah. Uh, it, that's such an positive thing. I mean, I um, within the Mozilla group, they've got a particular system which is uh, all about funding open source projects, which is coming out. And um, it has some incredible graphing capability because of how it redistributes funds uh, within that system. Um, so uh, there are ways of doing this sort of stuff. I, um, we're not there yet, though. I mean, to be blunt, um, we 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 lack, you know. I'm not. We're not even talking maps here. We're talking graphs of the connections between things. Um, to be blunt, uh, I you know, I, the only places that I've actually seen uh, where the market was able to um, create a deep understanding of the supply chains is the International Material Database System. Uh, which is in the automotive, and that's because the European Commission came out with some pretty hefty legislation forcing them to do so. And, and pretty much that's about it. I mean, um, I, I mean, SPOM is government action. I, I think it's going to require government action. I, I think we're not going to get it until actually uh, we have a government department of the supply chain or, or, or equivalent across multiple. Um, I, I hear a lot of talk. Uh, people say, "Well, come together and we'll, again, magic technology. It will all be sorted on the blockchain." Uh, I'm yeah. sure they say it will. You just throw a bit of AI on there, and magic will happen. Um, but um, uh, people like to keep their information in silos, even though it doesn't make a great deal of sense. Even though the value is uh, amplified by sharing it, they don't want to. Yeah. So. To solve these problems, I think eventually you're going to need government legislation. Yeah. Okay. I would add a, I would add a couple of things. I think one thing is where we we currently severely lacking is collaboration. So as you as you guys probably are aware, not re, not that long ago, only uh, U.S. government signed an executive cybersecurity order for government departments to collaborate on various cybersecurity issues, which is just a reason. Um, we have. We have a breakdown between government, private industry, and then vendors. You know, I can I can I think now you know I've, I've been I've been sharing my ideas about various vendors, but and I think there are some vendors who are really changing the landscape. I've been to a few calls where it's there's nothing talked about. You know, sales pitches with it's a, it's a collaboration culture where people are allowed to discuss various subjects under Chatham House rules. So I think, you know, vendors, private sector and government collaborating and sharing knowledge in some ways, it's a way forward because it, it's us against the bad guys. And the more we can work together, the more we're going to achieve. So how about, you know, because some of the vendors, you know, they're potentially working with hundreds or thousands of companies. So they have a lot of intelligence that could, you know, benefit the industry so how we can collaborate and share and knowledge and advance our you know collaboration that's that's the way forward i guess well the open security summit on that final note right is trying to do is bid for collaboration right i think we we do a lot of collaboration here you know get a lot of people together share a lot of information everything is posted on videos is you know is out there right so but i agree we need a lot more and we need to get some of us physically together but but yeah absolutely yeah. All right. On top of the hour on this, Simon, thanks again. Always brilliant. brilliant. You know, I, I love that you gave actually what you created was a really lovely, which I need to package and publish in the summit side on, you know, I, I always meet people tell Wally maps, take one thing for I just tell you. And I go read that, see that, that the first 15 minutes, nice and, and easy. Again, Marius, thanks. Thanks for collaborations. And I see you guys next time. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Take care. Mm-hmm.